Welcome to our first lesson from Chapter 21, America's Growing Influence. Whereas throughout our history, uh, there was this pervasive belief of isolationism, you know, kind of staying clear of foreign involvement. However, uh, after the 1870s, we start to look uh, outwards and look to try to gain more possessions. Areas already populated, and we look for them not for settlement, but for exploitation as we become more imperialistic. One of the major reasons why we start to look abroad is for our commercial interests. You see, as industries and farmers were able to produce more and more, you know, even more than the home market could consume, we sought out new markets, and we looked for new areas to try to invest abroad. We also looked to increase our trade. In fact, American exports in 1870 totaled $393 million. Twenty years later, in 1890, that was up to $858 million. And ten years after that, in 1900, it had rocketed up to $1.4 billion. And we looked to trade more and more, especially with Latin America and Asia, as these areas could now serve as like a safety valve for all of our industrial output. And as we look to increase our foreign trade, we also were competing with foreign powers who were carving up Africa and Asia as their own spheres of influence and places where they had trading privileges and in kind of their own colonies. Well, a naval strategist, Alfred T. Mahan, in his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, which he wrote in 1890, talked about how the United States needed a new, modernized Navy. And in it, he puts forth three tenets. He says, one, the United States needs to have a two-ocean Navy. You know, two separate navies, one that can patrol the Pacific and one that can patrol the Atlantic. He also proposed that the U.S. look for uh, naval bases around the world. You know, these could serve as coaling stations, places to refuel, uh, to resupply themselves, uh, but it would kind of open up, you know, the keep safe our ships as they were going from, you know, the United States to other markets and offer protection. And the third thing he proposed was a canal. And we end up eventually, um, you know, fulfilling all three of these things that Mahan put forth uh, when we kind of complete the Panama Canal later on. Uh, but Mahan proposed that these things were important for the United States so that we could be rich in peacetime and unbeatable in wartime, as he believed it was the Navy which would kind of secure our own safety and um, wealth. Another reason that kind of propelled America's growing influence throughout the world was social Darwinism. Now, this is a belief that you know some races are more developed, uh, more advanced uh, than other races, and that they need to protect and raise up the other kind of more childlike ethnicities. You know, there's kind of this racist belief um, that, you know, we had a superior culture, religion, uh, government, education, and even economy. You know, our way of life um, you know, was better than other people's. And we kind of looked like it was our duty to try to spread these things to, you know, other people living in other parts of the world. So really it was kind of this belief that the earth belonged to the strong and the rich. And kind of along this, those same lines, um, as argued by the Congregational Minister Josiah Strong, when he wrote about the United States having an obligation uh, to attempt to civilize and Christianize other people, you know, kind of advocating for the superiority of the Anglo-Saxon civilization. Uh, but he'd also argue it wasn't just for religious purposes, as you know, others also believed it was for you know economic and you know democratic purposes as well. But however it played out, you know, people in the United States started looking upon you know it was our job to try to uh, advance cultures around the world. Now, what kind of spurred us on to look outside of our boundaries was this belief of the closing of the American frontier. You know, it kind of led some to believe that America, which was this land of opportunity, would soon run out. You see, we'd kind of expanded from sea to shining sea. We had fought the natives and defeated them. 
You know, we had kind of uh, expanded our markets and our boundaries as far as they could go. And there was this belief of, you know, where else could we turn to now to spread this American exceptionalism? You know, where could we spread our culture and our way of life? And what markets would we expand to next? And with the closing of the frontier out west then, there was this kind of belief that we had to start looking outside of our boundaries. And that's when we start to look for those new markets and coaling stations and um, you know, new areas to try to conquer. But this belief wasn't anything new. As back in 1867, when Secretary of State William Seward, who was an ardent expansionist, kind of laid the groundwork for future American expansionism. And in 1867, he purchases Alaska from the Russians. Even though at the time it was called Seward's Folly, because people didn't really think Alaska was good for anything, um, he actually had to convince people that there was natural resources up there that would benefit the U.S. Um, in fact, though, he didn't just want to buy Alaska for the purpose of buying Alaska, but he also thought it might be the first step in able, uh, to being able to like claim all of Canada you know, and kind of squeeze the British out, um, and then eventually look to Mexico and islands around the world. So he really wanted the U.S. to kind of dominate all of the Americas. He even wanted the U.S. to build a canal and look to try to claim Hawaii because of its significance and its location in the Pacific. Um, all these things eventually come true, not while he's Secretary of State, but during this time period that we're looking at now, the late 1800s and early 1900s. And one of those areas that Seward had wanted was Hawaii. Um, in the 1820s, uh, America established its first uh, missionary there in an attempt to try to spread religion and culture and the United States way of life. But shortly thereafter, we also take an economic interest in Hawaii. And as uh, with many native inhabitants, America's view of these Hawaiians you know, are kind of as being backwards and not as advanced and not having our culture and religion. You know, kind of those things that we talked about as to why America was trying to go out during this time and uh, look to expand their influence. But when it comes down to it, Hawaii, which was nicknamed the Crossroads of the Pacific because it had so many shipping lanes go nearby or through it, um, you know, really had, you know, kind of an economic and military significance. You know, and as you're probably aware, you know, that's where Pearl Harbor is located today and how important that is of a naval base for the United States. And as it plays out, once the King of Hawaii dies, the Queen Lilikulani uh, it kind of comes to power. And she disliked the fact that the power was being wielded by the white minority. And she actually wanted Hawaiians to kind of reclaim the rule of Hawaii. But by 1890, as the McKinley Tariff raised barriers against Hawaiian sugar, American planters sought the annexation of Hawaii by the U.S. to try to eliminate those tariffs. And in fact, Americans led by Sanford B. Dole here, and with the support of the Marines, overthrew the Queen in an attempt to try to get Hawaii annexed. Well, um, this annexation was never ratified, um, and Cleveland, uh, President Cleveland, even attempts to restore the Queen. However, uh, the attempt by Cleveland to restore the Queen fails, and basically a government uh, being, is established that's kind of ran by the Americans that were uh, out there, kind of the, the businessmen that kind of came to dominate politics. Um, and through continued efforts, um, eventually, uh, by 1898, the U.S. does finalize the annexation under President William McKinley. Now, Sanford B. Dole had served as president while Hawaii was a republic and eventually serves as territorial governor once they're annexed by the United States. So, as you can see, you know, w there's many reasons why the U.S. started to look to expand its influence around the world, as well as a couple examples of where we expanded to. But we'll continue this look at American imperialism in our next episode.